I'm in part five of a collection of talks entitled Mindsets. And if I wanna become a new me, I must pursue a new mind. And we have been talking the last five weeks not about just pursuing the morals of Christ, but come on, I wanna pursue the mind of Christ. And I've been looking forward to preaching today. Philippians chapter four, verse four. This is what the apostle Paul says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Someone say always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace, someone say the God of peace, the God of peace will be with you. I wanna preach to you today about the God of peace and I've titled this fifth message in this collection, Peace of Mind. Peace of Mind. I I want your mindset to be one that you have peace today. How many out there, just by a show of hands, you could use some more peace? Anyone out there? Yeah, me too, me too, me too. Uh, We have been talking uh, over and over the last five weeks that we are in spiritual warfare. And that this spiritual warfare, it always begins in our mind. There is a battle going on for your thoughts. There is a battle going on for your thinking. And the enemy, the way that he tends to attack us is he comes and he lies and he puts little lies in our minds. And if those little lies are not actually attacked with God's truth, what happens is, is slowly but surely we find ourselves becoming bound and we begin to have things we call strongholds in our life. A stronghold is any area of your life that has a stronghold on you. It's an area that you are unable to get God's truth to it. It's actually a term that's used in warfare. A stronghold was when you would put a wall up for a fortress to keep the enemy out. And the way in which Paul uses it in his writing, he's talking about the fact that we create these walls where God's truth is unable to get in. If you want to know if you have a stronghold, the stronghold is evidenced by any area of your life that you are unable to receive God's truth. And we have been tearing those strongholds down. We have been attacking the lies of the enemy and we've been providing God's truth. And we've been talking a whole lot about this idea about renewing our mind. And those of you today that are not followers of Jesus or maybe you've got problems with the Bible, We welcome you here. Thank you for being at VU today. Science would just call it neuroplasticity, that you have the ability to change your brain by thinking new thoughts, by thinking positive thoughts. You can train, retrain your brain. The Apostle Paul, who I tend to believe his writings, he says that we are to renew our mind, that when we renew our mind through God's word, then we actually walk into transformation. I don't know about you, but I want to become a new me in 2022. And the only way I can become a new me is I have to have a new mind. And so I'm working with this premise today that a mind becomes renewed when it becomes released. Many of us, our mind is held hostage by the enemy. And many of us, we find ourselves being attacked all day long But if we're going to renew our mind, the result is that our mind becomes released. And what is the evidence of a free mind? There is one word. Here it is. Peace. Peace. What is the evidence that the stronghold is gone? Peace. What is the evidence that you now have received God's truth? Peace. What is the evidence that your mind is not held hostage? It is peace. And today I want to preach to you about peace 
of mind. I, I want you to walk in peace. I know these are difficult days and there's lots of things that we could find to disagree about and there's lots of things that we could have an opinion on, but I actually believe that if we're gonna build our life on anything, we ought to build it on the truth of God's word. And when I start to get God's word in my heart, no matter what is going on around me, no matter what the circumstance looks like, no matter how challenging this world is, I can walk with a peace of mind because peace is not about what's happening around me. Peace starts with what's happening inside of me. You know, when you go to a doctor, you sit down with a doctor, and if you've got some sort of a sickness, you tell them what's happening, and then they diagnose you, and then they write you a prescription. You take the prescription, you take it to the pharmacy, then you get the medication. How many of you know that the power of the prescription is always in the application? I can write you tons of prescriptions. It doesn't mean anything's going to change. You actually have to take the prescription and then you actually have to put it into application if you want any power, if you want any transformation. And Philippians chapter four, I believe, is Paul's prescription for peace for your life. And he prescribes how we get to that peace. He prescribes the pathway to that peace. He prescribes the process to that peace. But I'm telling you what, unless you apply his principles, you will not walk into that peace. I just wanna give you three little thoughts from Philippians chapter four, because I think these are some good thoughts, and I kind of feel like preaching. I know I'm 13 miles in, but my legs are coming back to me as I'm up here. <laughs> and if it gets real good, I'm gonna throw this medal on and say, yo, this is the best sermon I've ever preached in my entire life. Two hours and five minutes, nine minute thirties, nine, nine minute, was it nine? Nine thirty was my pace. How long did I train? I didn't train. <laughs> you don't have to prepare if you live prepared. Like, stop, stop, stop. No, sorry, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. It's my first faint. Like, I totally faint. You're like, the guy died, man. Prescription. First thing we see, Philippians chapter four. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Write this down. It's a choice to rejoice. It's a choice to rejoice. I'm gonna preach this until you start to believe it today. It's a choice to rejoice. Paul is writing, and he writes to this church in Philippi. Remember, we mentioned it last week. Paul is writing from a prison cell. Can't have peace, man. You don't know what's going on at work. I can't have peace, man. You don't know what's going on at my school. Can't have peace, man. You don't know what's going on in my family. Can't have peace, man. You don't know what's going on with my stock, with the stock market. I just can't. Okay, Paul is preaching from prison. And he starts by saying, hey, church in Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he really likes his point, and preachers do this sometimes. He's like, I'm gonna say it again. Rejoice. How many of y'all know if something's important, you tend to say it twice? That's what my mom did with me, you know? That's what my wife does with me. <laughs> Rich, clean the kitchen. I heard you. Clean the kitchen. Oh, yeah. I, I heard you. <laughs> That's what Paul's doing. Paul's like, no, you, you don't understand. I'm in prison, and I, I want you to get this because you're going to hear it, and it's going to sound like one of those church cliches, and you're going to say, did I really get up and go to the early service? Did I really stand on the back of a wall to hear this point? But Paul's saying, it's so important, I'm gonna say it again. I wanna double down on what I'm trying to tell you. It's a choice to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. The word rejoice to, means to, uh, to be glad in. What are we becoming glad in? What, what are we glad in? We're not glad in what, we're, we're glad in who. It says rejoice in the, the Lord. It doesn't say rejoice in your finances, doesn't say rejoice in your promotion, doesn't say rejoice in, he asked me finally. It doesn't say that. Doesn't say rejoice in we're pregnant. Doesn't say rejoice in I got into the school that I wanted to get into. It says rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because if you are only going to rejoice in a what, 
you will always end up finding yourself wanting more. But when you begin to rejoice in who, you will never stop praising God. <laughs> who is more important than what? That's why Paul says rejoice in the Lord. When, 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 when? When, no, no, when, 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 when? When, 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 when? But in the Greek, in the Greek. People are like, Whoa. always. But what about Monday? Always, bro. What about after a 13 mile race that you didn't train for? What about in sickness? What about in failure? What about in rejection? What about in setbacks? What about in loss? He's saying you rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because to rejoice is a choice. There's a lot of immature believers out there that they never get a peace of mind because they're, they're just waiting for a moment to rejoice. They're waiting for a moment to be glad in God. And they think they can only be glad in God when they're happy. The problem with happy is that we're not always happy. We're just not always happy. Like, like I don't know if you grew up in some kind of a community that told you, like, unless you're happy, then you're not really following God. No, no, no. Like, there comes moments. Life is full of ebbs and flows, peaks and troughs. There's real challenges, real suffering, real pain. Life is not all about happiness. The goal of life is not to be happy. Happy is based on happenings. And you can't control always what happens to you. But you can control how you respond to what happens to you. Therefore, it's a choice to rejoice. I'm just gonna be glad in God, regardless of what I'm going through. I'm just gonna be glad no matter what I'm facing. I'm just gonna praise God always. I'm not waiting for Sunday. I'm not waiting for my favorite song. I've made a choice to rejoice in God. Somebody give God some praise today. Come on all of our locations. It's a choice to rejoice. It's a choice to rejo rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. It's really important. It's really, really important that you walk out of here and you don't wait till next Sunday before you get glad in God. Everything starts to shift when this starts to happen because now all of a sudden you have shifted from you're not worshiping or praising for it, you're praising him. And so it doesn't really matter if it ever happens, you still have him. I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know what you're waiting for. But the good news is, is you get to wait with him. You get to wait with God. You get to walk with him. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll, I'll say it again. Rejoice. And here is what is so powerful about this. Because we're talking about spiritual warfare at the end of the day when it comes to this mindset's collection. We're talking about how the enemy comes and attacks you and he puts lies into your brain and then you click on those lies and before you know it, you go down all of these awful trails. Here's what's amazing. When you become a person who rejoices always, the devil doesn't know what to do with you. You ever have your kids like just say something like you weren't expecting? Like, you know, the other day I'm like, Wyatt! Go to your room, you're in big trouble. Dad, I love you. <laughs> okay, well come, come back out. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking, you know? <laughs> like, sometimes the response is different from my, than my expectation. Let me just tell you, the enemy thinks that when you're going through sorrow that you ought to be sorrowful. The enemy thinks that when you're going through pain you ought to just dig a hole and die but he does not know what to do with a person. You start to confuse his plans. You start, to, I'm telling you what, you start to stop his schemes. You thwart his threats when you start rejoicing in God always. You think it's just some hype stuff in church. It is not. It comes from a deep place. It is a, it is a picture of a mature believer who gets up every morning and says, I've made a decision. I'm gonna rejoice in the Lord. It is my choice. I have decided. No
no matter what is going on around me. It might be bad, but God is still good. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Notice what he says. He says that when you rejoice, you're going to become gentle. You ever notice that um, people who, whose, whose mind is not free tend to, tend to hurt people? When your ma- mind is bound by the enemy, you, you, you hurt people. What's amazing is that when you start to rejoice in the Lord always, the result is you become gentle towards people. Now, this is, let's make something clear. Gentleness, some of us are like, I don't, bro, I'm not going for gentle, you know? Like, but, but, but gentleness is not a sign of weakness. Gentleness is a sign of somebody who knows how to control their strength. I just want to make this really practical. How, how many know that a lot of the worry, a lot of the anxiety that we have in our lives, it's because of the relationships around us? Come on. Some of y'all know that your anxiety and your worry, that other people around you, they have to deal with your irritability overflow. You you know this to be true. Like, you ever notice that like the people that you you love the most, you tend to hurt the worst? What is it? It's because sometimes we're going through something so, so big and so hard. And so the people that we're the most vulnerable, the most close with, we tend to hurt them. And before you know it, as we hurt them, it doesn't bring us any more peace. It causes us more worry. It causes us more stress. It causes us more anxiety. It takes our mind away again. But Paul is saying, when you rejoice in the Lord always, the result is you become gentle towards those around you. And it actually starts to fix your horizontal relationships with other people. He says this. He says, the Lord is near. Now, when he says the Lord is near, he's not talking about the second coming of the Christ. He's not talking about like, get ready. He, that, that's, not, that's not what he's he referencing to. He's referencing to the simple fact that Jesus is quite close to you. He, he's not far from you. He, he's right there. I have learned over and over again in my life that, that the answer to my problem is always closer than I thought. In fact, I'm gonna say it this way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna prophesy. The miracle for Vu Church is not outside of these walls. The miracle is always in the house. I'm, I'm not, we're not looking for some person to come and build us a building. No, it's happening right here. The leaders are right here. The pastors are right here. They're, they're right here in the room. The miracle is always in the house. I remember when um, we were trying to find our first location, we had announced that we were gonna plant a church in Miami. The year was 2014 and we were excited. It's very easy to cast vision. It's another thing to execute vision. Anybody can make an announcement. It takes somebody else who can actually walk that thing out. Just like, you know, anybody can get married. Hello. <laughs> it's another thing to, to be married, you know, right? I've seen some beautiful weddings, hey? Okay. It means nothing. <laughs> Commitment goes beyond the ceremony. And so we were, we were, we were so challenged because we had announced, you know, we're going to start this church. But then like, you know, like, that was in September, and by the time we got to like May of the next year, we still hadn't found a place to gather our church. And everyone's like, you know, when are you gonna start church? When are you gonna start church? When are you gonna start church? At the time, I was living on 30th in Biscayne, the Edgewater area. And it's so wild because after like 11 months, one day as we were driving by 95, a place that we had driven by all the time, in fact, it was on 31st Street and 5th Avenue. I mean, just a few blocks away from where I live. I had driven by this school so many times. One day, Don, Shree and I were getting off the highway, and we see this school. We said, hey, let's just go see if that school, what, what's over there? And we pull into the parking lot. I think we kind of broke in, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and we got into an auditorium, and we, we walked into the, the Jose de Diego Middle School Auditorium. And Don, Shree and I, we had a video. I don't know what happened. But we're like, this is it. This is the place that God is going to give us. And some of you know the story. We ended up launching there. Before you know it, we were running six services on a Sunday out of that room. 9, 11, 1, 4, 6, and 8 p.m. Of course I can run a 13-mile race without training. (laughs) Nothing. Try preaching six times. So. I always think what's crazy is that the answer was so close. The answer was right there next to me. I just didn't know where to look. You know what's really crazy? I have three children. All three of my children, I was living up until this past year, 
way over there in Morningside in this area near the Design District, 50th and Biscayne. All three of my kids, I remember my firstborn son, Wyatt, was born at South Miami Hospital. I told my wife, I said, why are we, t- this is like a road trip. We gotta get Gatorades and bugles and like gas up the car, like, let's just go to Mount Sinai. She's like, no, I wanna be at South Miami. And so we came over. I, I literally thought I was like on a road trip having children. I'm like, this is different. And first child, the second child, you know what's really crazy? Our third child, Waylon, we had her in July. And this day after she was born, some of you know she went to the NICU and I was sitting in our doctor's room at the hospital. And I look out the window and to my amazement, I look across and I see this big black cross right here from the South Miami location. I could see the church from the hospital in which all three of my kids were born. What are you saying, Rich? I'm just saying the answer is always so much more close than you know. And I just want to encourage you today, the resource that you need is closer than you know. The relationship that you need is closer than you know. The joy you're looking for, it's closer than you know. Come on, the peace that you need is closer than you know. God is near. Rejoice, somebody give God some praise. It's a choice to rejoice. It's a choice to rejoice. God is near, and I'm gonna keep worshiping him because I believe the answer is near. How near? Across the street, all three of my babies were born. I had no idea that God was leading us to a church. I had no idea that outside my window was an answer to a prayer we had been praying for almost seven years. God is near. Rejoice. It's a choice. Paul makes this prescription. He doesn't just say it's a choice to rejoice. He also says, Release the prayer to receive the promise. Verse six, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition. In week one, we talked about that we live in the world. I can't escape that, that I am walking in this flesh and I struggle with my flesh. And we mentioned the idea that at times because we're fighting back in our flesh, at times we have some of these things, but these things don't have to have us. There's moments that you're gonna have some stress, but stress doesn't have to have you. There's moments that you have a little bit of anxiety, but anxiety doesn't have to have you. There's moments that fear will come upon you, but fear doesn't get to have you. We could keep going through it and you say, but Rich, okay, how do I know if it has me? You know if it has you when it has you strong and when it has you long. We have to pay attention to the things that have us because the only way we're gonna break those bonds and the only way we're gonna break through those moments is through prayer and petition. It is through getting God's truth into our spirit. It's getting God's truth into our heart. I'm learning more and more that so often in life, what happens is, is that we're going through life and we continue to to step into these pathways and these places. And as we're going from place to place, we're not taking time to release prayer under the Lord and saying, God, I wanna give you my anxiety. God, I wanna give you my fear. God, I wanna give you my shame. God, I wanna give you my concern. I think for a lot of us, what ends up happening is the reason why we're so anxious and the reason why we do not have peace is because we're trying to control things and we're trying to fix things. I sat with a counselor friend of mine not too long ago and he's actually a friend, but sometimes I'm like, are you working right now? Or he was working and we were talking and he started diagnosing me, which I sort of gave him permission for. And he said, Rich, what's really unique about you that you ought to know is that when it comes to your life, You're actually not trying to dominate. You're not actually trying to be the best. It's not how you use your gifts. Instead, the thing about you, Rich, and it was an eye-opening thing. I don't know if you've ever gone to counseling and they say something, you're like, whoa, this is getting deep. You know, it's like, wow. Like, he goes, your thing is not about being the best. Your thing is about being special. I don't know, maybe you're like, yeah, I want to be special. I mean, I think we all want to be, but when he said it, it hit me so hard. 
because he spoke right to some pain in my life. He spoke right to, in many ways, a stronghold in my life. You see, I don't have to be the best. I just have to stand out from the rest. Hence why I had to run a 13-mile marathon and come and preach. I didn't have to win the race, but I had to show up and preach. That's special. But what does that do to? That is due to a spirit of fear and perfectionism. So many of us, we go through life never addressing our fears and never getting to the place that we struggle with perfection. What is perfection at its core? Perfectionism is an attempt. It's a safety mechanism for you to protect yourself from pain. Like we, we've gone through pain, we've all gone through something. And so you in your mind, in your subconscious mind, you tell yourself, I know how to protect myself from this pain. I, I've dealt with the pain of failure. I don't wanna do that again. I know the pain of rejection. I, I, I know the pain of not measuring up. I know the pain of not being accepted. And so what do I do? I control things and I fix things because deep down I'm actually afraid that I won't measure up. And so if I can control the narrative and if I can control the scenario, then somehow I will be safe. But I just wanna to preach to you today. And I'm preaching to myself as I say it. You can have peace today, but you have to release your expectation of perfection. If you'll just let that go, if you'll actually do what you say, I trust in God, God is in control. I'm actually gonna cast all my cares upon him because here's the best part of that scripture, because he cares for you. If God didn't care for you, I don't think that you should release your anxiety upon him. But we know that God cares for you. We know that God loves you. We see this, not just in his words, we see this in demonstration that he died on a cruel cross for you 2,000 years ago. He loves you. You can trust him with your heart. You can trust him with your plans. You can trust him with your soul. You can trust him because he cares for you. So you can release prayer. God, I'm bringing you all of who I am. And as I release the prayer, I'm going to receive the promise. Listen to me, if you have time to complain about it, you have time to pray about it. You do. We ought to stop complaining and start praying. But I think if we started doing that, what we would discover is there's a whole lot of people that are not actually after resolve, they're actually after attention. I just want attention. I just want you to see me. I just want you to know, like, hey, like, Hey, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm broken, I'm dysfunctional. But that's not who we are at Voo Church. That's not what you're called to. We're called to go on the path of healing. We're called to go on the path of freedom. I don't wanna live bound. I wanna live totally free in Jesus. Therefore, I bring all of who I am to him. And we gotta be careful because sometimes what we tend to do is we bring God an external issue, but we don't bring the internal emotion. Oh God, I'm kind of dealing with stress. No, no, no. You bring the stress before him. You bring the anxiety before him. This is what it means to pray. Prayer is a two-way street. It's me talking and it's me listening. It's me releasing and it's me receiving. It's me getting loud and it's me getting quiet. It's a two-way street. And according to God's word, on the other side of those prayers, on the other side of those petitions, there is a great promise. What is the great promise? He says that when you present your prayers and your petitions with thanksgiving, that's a big word right there. And God, he says, I will give you peace. My peace transcends all understanding. Another, another way it says is my peace passes all understanding. I like the word transcends though, because it means to go above. And we've been talking about setting our mind on, a, on something higher, something bigger than just this world. Isn't it good news today? that God, his peace is higher than your problem. His peace is higher than your pain. His peace is higher than your struggle. In fact, the scripture says, this peace which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. We talked about strongholds keeping things out. Now we're talking about the God of heaven and earth who will guard your heart and your mind. Woo! How come you're not freaking out? My God's guarding me. 
How come you're not worried right now? Because God's guarding me. How come you're not crying? Because God's guarding me. How come you're not gossiping? Because God's guarding me. How come you're not bitter after all that? Because God's been guarding me. It's not for me. It's all unto him. It is unto his glory. I have released prayers and through it, I have received his promise. Come on, if you believe it, go ahead and make a little bit of noise out there. God's been guarding me. God's been guarding me. I'm protected by peace. I'm protected by peace. I'm protected by peace. Last week, I, um, I was out of town on what is becoming my annual wilderness week. Some of you remember in January of 2021, as we took six months to teach the gospel of Mark, there's this Greek word, eremos, which is this space where it's known as the wilderness, but as we see it show up in the gospel of Mark, we see it show up in lots of different areas. We see Jesus tempted in the Aramos. We see John the Baptist preaching in the Aramos. We see Jesus getting away to the Aramos. It's not uh, necessarily this, this wasteland of destruction, but instead it's this place of repentance, restoration, rejuvenation. And I took the text quite literally. And so last year was my first time getting away for about three or four days and uh, take a couple guys with me and we just hike. We read something together. We meditate on something together. We, we, uh, we pray uh, we hike, honestly, every day, I don't know, 17, 18 miles uh, it, from, from 6 a.m. till about 10 p.m. at night. Every hour is programmed and accounted for. And it's just sort of a week of discipline where we get our souls rejuvenated. And last week we were there in Georgia and we were studying the book of Revelation. That's fun. And uh, it was a beautiful time together. And as we're studying Revelation, there's a description of what John sees and how he sees Jesus. And it's a beautiful description. And sometime I'll preach it to you about how he sees Jesus and Jesus's eyes are like fire and his hair, it's white like wool because he is the ancient of days. He has watched every empire come and go, but he still remains. His feet are bronze because he's stable and you can lean upon him. He wears a robe much like the priestly robe, but also a kingly robe because he is the true Melchizedek. Uh, Am I saying that right? Melchizedek. I said it the other way, kind of bad there. It kind of scared me. We'll have to edit that. Melchizedek. He's the true Melchizedek. <laughs> I just faint, you know. His last thing that he told us was Melchizedek. Never mind, I'll stop. <laughs> he loved Melchizedek. He is the, okay, sorry. These are dumb Old Testament jokes. Um, sorry. Know your Bible. <clears throat> but one thing it says that's beautiful is that when he speaks, his, his tongue is in the shape of a sword because that when God's truth comes in, it cuts in, it cuts down the lies. Like it's, his word is warfare in your life. And it says that his voice is like the sound of rushing waters. And as I'm reading this in Revelation, I'm sitting by this river in Georgia and I'm out on these rocks and this rushing river is coming through and I am just taken to another place as I'm just spending time with God in his presence, as I am releasing my prayers, as I'm sharing with God my vulnerable things. I'm not just talking about issues. I'm bringing my emotion to God. And as I'm there in this place, I'm receiving promises from God that he is close, that he won't leave me, that he'll walk with me. And the rushing waters are going. And if you've ever sat by a river, I'm telling you what, it does something to your soul. It's a little bit different from downtown traffic. It settles your soul. It calms your soul. It brings peace to your soul. And I'm just thinking about when God's voice speaks, it's like a sword that cuts through the lies, but it's also like rushing waters where it quiets the noise of this world. And his voice is all that you can hear. Friends, we must we must release our prayers. And as I say that, I'm not just talking about saying things. I'm talking about bringing the totality of who I am. I cannot be fake in front of an omniscient God. And as I bring the totality of who I am, I receive his encouragement. I receive his peace. What's his peace? His peace transcends all understanding. His peace doesn't make any sense. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of peace I need because this world don't make no sense. And 
if I'm going to walk in joy, and if I'm going to walk stable, I'm going to need a peace that is illogical. It's a choice to rejoice. Paul's writing a prescription. You can hear it, but you won't see any power unless it's applied. And he says, you got to release your prayers to receive the promise. And then lastly, as the team comes up, whatever is, let it be intentional. You can just wait for me, Fed. Whatever is, let it be intentional. You say, Richard, what, what kind of a point is that? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna come there right now. Peace doesn't come from right praying. It also comes from right thinking. I can't just pray. I gotta, I gotta reset my mind. And he says, finally, brothers, this is verse eight. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, think about such things. What a practical prescription. Like what a literal thing that you can do walking out of here today. So the prescription is whatever is, let it be intentional. Because how many know, a lot of people, when it comes to their thinking, it's uh, whatever is happening is what I'm thinking about. Whatever is in front of me is what I'm thinking about. Whatever is urgent is what I'm thinking about. Whatever my friends say is cool is what I'm thinking about. Whatever is important to the culture is what I'm thinking about. Whatever is on the front page of the news is what I'm thinking about. But that is not the counsel of the Apostle Paul. He's saying, you can't have a positive life with a negative mind. You can't keep feeding your mind what strengthens negativity. You have to actually fight back against those thoughts and you have to force yourself to think the right things. See, it's not enough for us to go, you know, man, like I'm just trying to fight bad feelings. You're not going deep enough. You're dealing with a symptom instead of the root. We actually have to come at it from a deeper way. I'm not just gonna fight against negative emotions. I'm gonna fight against the negative thoughts that create the negative emotions. I'm gonna actually set my mind on the right thing. I'm actually gonna do what the apostle Paul is saying. I remember that quote, I don't know if you've ever heard it before. I can't stop a bird from landing in my head, but I can stop him from building a nest. So you can't control every thought that comes through here. But you can decide, are you going to be intentional if you're going to dwell on that thought? I've made up my mind. Thoughts are going to come and thoughts are going to go. But I get to choose what type of thoughts I'm going to dwell on. So here's the homework. What do I dwell on? Is it true? Well, I feel like it's true. Not a good test. Is it noble? Think about a king. Think about a queen. Think about royalty. Is this right? How many of y'all know that honestly, the right thing is always the hard thing? Always. Thinking the right thought, it's always gonna have some difficulty in it. Is this pure? Is this lovely? Is this admirable? Is this excellent? Is this praiseworthy? If not, stop dwelling on it. Whatever is, let it be intentional. Whatever it is that your mind is going to dwell on, let it be intentional. See, we can't expect to get a peace of mind if you only give God a piece of your mind. We have to give him Everything. My friend Daniel Groves was preaching not too long ago and I heard him teach on this concept that's so ministered to me. And I'm not much of a musician, although I love our worship team here and I'm so grateful for these guys. And you guys are actually gearing up to uh, record a new record in March. Shout out to VU Worship. We love these guys. We're proud of them. But here this morning at South Miami is one of my favorite keyboard players of all time. This is our friend Federico for about um, for about four years I called him Fernando <laughs> I apologize for that but he's fed and he, he's an amazing keyboard player and 
in, in music, there's a thing called a staccato note. Have you heard of that before, a staccato note? Staccato note is like a sharp, quick note. It's like, it's just, it's, it's sharp, it's short. In fact, can you just, can you even do, ooh, wow. We haven't practiced this yet. Um, and I was just wondering today if that's where a lot of us find ourselves as we give God a piece of our mind. We never get a piece of mind. And so our piece is kind of like a staccato note. Like, just give me that again, Fed. I hope I make it. Uh, I think we're going to pay the bills. There, yeah, oh, okay, maybe. Wow, that was a good Sunday. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I'm going to, maybe, I have to, Oh, yeah, thank you. (laughs) We should go on the road together, brah. I think think crew was good. I mean, um, yeah. So many of us, what happens is, is we take peace like that. We get these short little bursts these little tiny moments, and it's just, it's just a piece of peace. But I'm telling you what, God did not send his son 2,000 years ago so you could simply have a piece of peace. He didn't come with staccato peace. Our God wants to give you sustained peace. See, behind that keyboard, uh, Fed has this little pedal. It's called a sustain pedal. And he can hit that same note with the sustain pedal. Watch this. Ooh. And that same note all of a sudden kind of now starts to shift the room a little bit. Starts to settle our soul. Maybe nothing around me has all the way changed, but something inside of me certainly is. And it's called sustained peace. And look at what the writer says. You can keep playing, Fed, because it sounds prettier when you're playing and I might faint or not make it to the next service if you don't wrap this one up. It says that whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. I love this. And the God of peace will be with you, not come upon you. The God of peace will visit you, doesn't visit you. The God of peace will vacation with you. The God of peace will meet you on Sundays at the early service because that's where the most spiritual people go. It says the God of peace will be with you. Why? Because the God who starts this peace is the same God who wants to sustain this peace. He wants you to sustain this peace. He wants to give you a peace of mind. This world, it's shaky, man. You can't control all the people in your life. People are gonna let you down. Boss will let you down. Spouse will let you down. Kids will let you down. Your pastor will let you down. Circumstances will let you down. Events happen, things change. I mean. We went through a pandemic. None of us saw that coming. Sometimes our life and our pace, it gets going fast. And so our pace lets us down. But there is a God who is the God of peace. And he will never let you down. In fact, he will sustain you from the start to the end. That's why it says that this God, he's the one who is the author of our faith. He is also the finisher of our faith. And let me just add this. He is the perfecter. He is the sustainer. He is the maintainer. He is the developer of our faith. It's a prescription to peace. Dr. Apostle Paul says it's a choice to rejoice. And he says, release that prayer, receive that promise. Prayer is a two-way street. You share it all. You bring it all to God. But it's not just right praying that you need. You're going to need some right thinking. 
So whatever it is, let it be intentional. I am making up my mind today that I'm gonna dwell on noble things, praiseworthy things, excellent things, right things, true things, admirable things. And when I do, the great promise is that he will sustain me and he will keep me. And the God of peace, come on somebody, the God of peace will be with you. Come on, if you believe it, go ahead and give God a shout of praise. Hey, this is Rich and Don Shree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to come. come.